Aloha and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host today, Mitch Yuan. Our underwriter is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and that's a program under the Nat Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, HNEI. I'm very pleased to welcome our guest, uh, Mark Glick, who's the new chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And Mark, welcome to the show. Hi, Mitch. Great to be here. Yeah, great to have you. And our we're going to be talking today about the uh, Policy Forum's 2022 Legislative Day Brief, which is gonna be held on January uh, the 28th in uh, this year, like in about a week and a half or two weeks. And uh, it's gonna be also, uh, we're talking about plugging the uh, energy infrastructure gaps. So that's part of what it's all about. Uh, just a little blurb on the uh, forum, if I may. Uh, throughout its history, the forum has constantly strived to remain relevant and at the edge, front edge of uh, Hawaii's energy policy space. And we've adjusted its programs to support Hawaii's evolving energy situation in all its many facets. Uh, H&E has really take, recently taken over the overall management of the forum and has a new leadership team with new ideas and new initiatives going forward to uh, from 2022 and beyond, including broader membership, more outreach and analytics based policy development. So we're going to be talking story with Mark about the forum's first major project, the 2022 legislative brief being held on the 28th of January. But before we get to that, let's have a look at all of the different funds available to Hawaii. So uh, Mark, uh, we have a set of slides from NASIO who have, uh, and I'm going to let you uh, talk about those slides and what that information is all about. The bottom line is there's one heck of a lot of money out there at the federal level that could come to Hawaii to help us out. And I don't want to steal your thunder, so over to you. Yeah, no, thank you. You know, the $1.2 trillion uh, Bipartisan Infrastructure Act um, is really an astounding piece of legislation because it's so um, comprehensive, but it can be misleading, I think, uh, because essentially it takes a lot of formula funds uh, for um, standing up the Department of Transportation and uh, the Department of Energy. Um, so it, it basically carries on uh, surface transportation and, uh, and, and other activities that normally get funded. In fact, many years ago before gridlock in Congress, uh, these were uh, done in a comprehensive fashion. Recently, they've just been pushed down the road a little bit um, with continuing resolutions. Uh, this bill basically gives a gives them a, a big boost. So a lot of the funding is through these normal pathways. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But there's some other pathways, the state energy program in particular, uh, that's typically administered through the Department of Energy. And it goes to state energy offices. I'm going to talk about in the slide uh, that you see here is actually the national funding uh, coming through, and this is from the National Association of State Energy Officials, NASIO, uh, which we work, we've worked very closely with for a number of years. Um, the state energy program has $500 million that will go through a formula uh, scenario to each of the energy offices, uh, in addition to its typical annual uh, state energy program appropriations. Now, this will require a letter from each governor of the states uh, to uh, basically say these funds will help us carry out a required energy security plan. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion about, you know, what will be in those letters. Um, and so NASIO, in fact, has uh, asked that there be a standard letter uh, for all of the states that will cover these issues because it could very well be that this could be a long, you know, extended process if you if each of the 50 states has to come up with their own language and try to figure out what they're going to say to compel their governors uh, to to flow this money in the right direction. Uh, so that's $500 million. There would be $3.5 billion for what's called a weatherization, uh, weatherization uh, assistance program. Uh, in Hawaii, that's typically managed by the Office of uh, Community Services in the Department of Labor. Um, so, you know, I think it will be um, really kind of fascinating to see whether or not 
the governor's letter will also sort of ask that to go in that direction or be a, an, another place. Um, there's also, um, I'll, I'll skip over LIHEAP, which doesn't apply too much. It, it has to do with uh, uh, typically heating programs of which, you know, the tropical settings like uh, Hawaii don't really have to deal with that much. $150 million into something that hadn't been used very much since uh, the American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act back in 2009, uh, something called the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant. Um, historically, that was a big funding source. Uh, we used it when I was energy administrator uh, for a significant amount of funding. I think it was uh, some, somewhere in the neighborhood of $11 million came through the state energy office then. The total funding uh, of 550 million, 28% of that will go to the state energy office via for formula. Uh, I think that's where you get the $150 million um, uh, figure. And then $100 million for energy efficiency revolving loan fund uh, capitalization grant program, and that's uh, for commercial residential uh, buildings. And that'll go through a formula uh, to the state energy offices. Um, if you uh, go down a little bit lower into this high priority potential or competitive funding for state energy offices, you'll see $40 million uh, for energy auditor training uh, grant program. Energy auditor is extremely important uh, to, particularly when you're looking at building retrofits, to be able to come up with baseline uh, information uh, so that you can talk about what improvements uh, can be made in those buildings. Building energy codes. Now that's really directed towards new buildings, um, you know, having a little bit more stringent uh, standards so they're more efficient. Uh, that'll be a competitive program. The states are eligible and it's not clear, frankly, in that competitive uh, uh, sort of grant, uh, how DOE is going to uh, configure that. I might point out that in all of these um, programs or these funding opportunities, none of this hasn't been determined in terms of, you know, obviously the formula will flow through to states in normal ways that the formulas normally get sent through. But on the other type of funding, competitive, uh, these will be competitive solicitations. And the Department of Energy and the Department of Transportation, and the two primary agencies that will be flowing these funds through to the states, there's a lot of work to be done over the next number of months. And the way this bill was passed had very little guidance on uh, to these agencies on how those programs should be configured. So they have to come up with that almost from uh, ground up. So that's a, a laborious uh, process. And I think that's one reason why the Energy Policy Forum is getting so involved in this to help uh, make sure that we, we don't lose any opportunities. Absolutely. And I understand that the Department of Energy has like 180 days to write the plan and it's been all hands on deck. They've canceled a lot of their normal outreach programs so they can, you know, get all the people organized to write this monster plan. So it's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, so far, you know, the, none of us have seen many details on the implementation. Um, and, and yeah, clearly um, the agency is uh, overworked, uh, to say the least, uh, in coming up with how to procure um, these multiple uses, you know, grants for charging and fueling infrastructure, grants for energy efficiency improvements and renewable energy improvements uh, wholesale you know, public school facilities and so on. Um, you know, there's, so there's, there's enormous, you know, number of opportunities. We intend to lay those out um, at the briefing, legislative briefing, and have experts in many of these fields talk about what they see as the key priorities or gaps that need to be filled uh, that might be, able, uh, that we might be able to fill with this particular uh, type of funding. Right. So uh, we do you think we can uh, go now to the agenda for the uh, legislative brief? 
Let's uh, pull up those slides, Michael. There you go. Uh, next slide. There you go. So Mark, uh, what I've done is I've laid out the agenda for the legislative brief. And so you know, if you want, if you wouldn't mind, uh, the two of us can uh, go through this and highlight the, the points who the speakers are and what we hope to get out of it to give people an idea of what we're gonna be talking about and why they should uh, dial in and listen, particularly since there's money in them, our hills. Right. Yeah, and well, you know, we'll kick it off, you know, first and foremost, uh, as you mentioned, you know, Hawaii Natural Energy Institute has recently taken over the Hawaii uh, Policy uh, Forum. I think Rick Rochelot, the director of uh, the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, uh, will talk a little bit about it, very briefly touch upon that uh, in his opening remarks. Um, and, you know, essentially how we're going to be configured to identify uh, the gaps in Hawaii's energy transition to be able to use uh, analysis and white papers to be able to explore what those difficult issues are, and then basically have a dialogue among the key stakeholders uh, to try to fill those gaps. He'll talk specifically about some of the uh, pending needs, some of the research that we've done it recently um, yeah. at the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute to um, deal with uh, some pending issues uh, on renewable generation and gaps in uh, some of the most important resources, uh, not only from uh, base load generation, but also how are we dealing with, um, you know, the vari variable uh, renewable uh, generation uh, with storage and other techniques and how far can we go? What are some of the gaps that we can, we can fill with infrastructure funds? Um, and, then we will dive deeply, uh, very quickly, into um, the program and, and trying to look at, in I think, two fundamental blocks, uh, what these issues are. But first, we'll, we, we're going to have a special guest. At this point, it's a mystery guest uh, from either the Department of Energy or from a congressional office which will demystify as much as they, they'll be able to do in just a week from Monday, um, what, what is known about the process uh, to get these funds out from the federal government through um, primarily the Department of Transportation and the Department of Energy uh, uh, to Hawaii. And um, the whole idea is to um, kind of open the door for us to be able to closely monitor that as it, as it goes along and to be able to alert the appropriate parties about what the opportunities, particularly in these competitive funding areas. Uh, so that, again, it doesn't get lost. So that, that'll be the initial uh, discussion. I think we'll do that in about um, you know, 15, 14 minutes. And then we'll have the state energy, uh, the, the chief um, energy officer, uh, Officer of the um, from the state energy office uh, for the state of Hawaii, uh, give some opening remarks. Obviously, the state energy program funding uh, would be flown through uh, Scott Glenn's office, and so uh, he is engaged in discussions right now with the Department of Energy and other key players like Hawaii Energy about how those funds will be used. So. Uh, it'll be important for him to provide some opening remarks there. And then we'll go right into what we're calling urgent energy infrastructure needs. And so here we are. So we have uh, some very good speakers and some interesting topics. And uh, this, these are not history lessons. Uh, these are like to identify what are the gaps? Where do we need to put our priorities? So how about introducing the various topics that we're going to be uh, talking about, Mark? Sure. You know, I, um, as we uh, went along in, you know, trying to establish what we were going to do at HNEI and managing and coordinating the work of um, the Energy Policy Forum moving forward, we decided to reach, recontact all of the key stakeholders, the members, and, uh, and basically set up uh, interviews uh, to discuss what their primary issues were. Uh, 
uh, everyone knows Dean uh, Nishima, uh, who is uh, Nishina, who's the uh, consumer advocate. And Dean had some very uh, important points about uh, the fairness that needs to take place throughout uh, Hawaii's energy investments so that everyone uh, has equal access uh, to clean energy. And we thought it would be really ideal for him to talk about essentially what values need to be placed into these uh, solicitations and what do we need to do uh, to essentially ensure that all parts of our community um, can benefit fairly uh, from these clean energy opportunities. So I, I expect to hear that from, uh, from Dean. Uh, he talked very eloquently about that when we visited with him. Um, Brian Kealoa, everyone knows he's been doing a really outstanding job uh, leading Hawaii Energy. Uh, we've had really wonderful conversations along, uh, along with uh, the deputy there, uh, Carolyn Carl. Uh, and what we've learned is that in terms of, there, there are some, you know, in addition to, of course, all of the uh, fundamental work to work with key energy users and create uh, efficiency opportunities. And we work very closely with them on building retrofits and new innovations there. Um, Brian has really focused a lot of energy on trying to fill the gaps through efficiency gains in what we're, you know, what, what we're going to deal with as we move closer to the shutdown of the AES coal plant. So that's a key infrastructure issue in terms of the generation picture in Oahu. Uh, so we expect him to uh, deal with that and and talk about any of the other issues that he's he's dealing with relative to uh, working with the energy office on this funding. Uh, and of course, Colton Ching, uh, everyone knows uh, his role as a senior vice president over uh, planning and technology at Hawaiian Electric. And, um, and of course, talking about um, what they see over their entire system there are significant amount of grid modernization opportunities uh, with this funding, as well as the generation issues that we're talking about. So um, I think he'll talk about that across the board. He'll probably also touch upon uh, some important planning uh, efforts that we will likely take on uh, through committees at the uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. Uh, one of them has to do with renewable energy zones. Uh, essentially uh, trying to identify uh, working with the community the appropriate kinds of generation uh, measures and, and technologies that are acceptable in, in, in communities across the islands. Um, that'll be a big deal as we reach higher rates of uh, renewable penetration. Um, and so I think you'll touch briefly upon that issue as well. So next we launch into resiliency, which is uh, really important, particularly uh, when you talk about uh, tsunamis and uh, hurricanes and and just like losing the grid itself uh, if it goes down. So uh, how about running through your list here? Start sure. With David. So, you know, on these urgent infrastructure issues, what we've uh, decided to do is have split the session into two parts. The first part that I've just talked about, and then essentially have a session on straight talk on resilience. Um, and how, how do we safeguard our energy infrastructure and dealing with a lot of things that are often put off. Um, and so at the end of that discussion, we're gonna bring all the people together to talk about the priorities and what really we need to make sure absolutely gets funded. On the resilience side, you really can't have this discussion without having the Hawaii Energy Management Agency at the table. And the person that has been so keenly involved in the reform of that agency and making it much more effective is David Lopez, the executive officer. I'm very excited that um, they're willing to do that. He and Luke Meyer are doing a really outstanding job and really 
um, streamlining it and making sure that the priorities uh, of the key uh, elements are done and the training is, is also consistent with that. So I think he'll lay out very effectively um, his candidate appraisal on what needs to be done. We'll have also uh, Kevin uh, Nishimura, who's the Vice President of Operations for Hawaii Gas, to talk about uh, sustainable approaches that they're looking at and what investments are necessary to move forward on that. Uh, clearly, if you're able to have um, renewable gas uh, more widely used, that will fill some important gaps. And that's been a difficult challenge. So, but in, you know, investment, it could be a deciding factor on making that much more realistic and pervasive. And Hawaii Gas would be the appropriate implementation arm to carry that out. Um, Rick Pinkerton, we know particularly when we're talking about, he's the head of asset planning and strategy for Hawaiian Electric, um, but it's something that isn't often talked about widely. And that's what are the threats to our energy system. Uh, and this also invo involves cybersecurity. Um, and so this is sort of going to bring that issue to the fore. Uh, and, and Rick is you know, directly involved in, uh, the, in dealing with those issues. Obviously, the threats are pervasive. It's, it's quite scary, frankly, how often uh, from outside, uh, outside of Hawaii, attempts are made to um, destroy or to um, sort of dismantle our energy infrastructure uh, through cybersecurity means. Uh, that, again, isn't often widely talked about, uh, but we wanted to make sure, particularly with this level of funding that's supposed to be dealing with resilience and cybersecurity, that we don't miss an opportunity to help plug our system and, and make it safer. And you know, finally, uh, we will have Mark Want. Mark Want uh, is the leader of uh, Resilience and Energy Assurance for the Hawaii State Energy Office. He's been doing that for years. People who have been working in this space know and respect Mark. Uh, he's really one of the outstanding public officials in this um, discipline. And it's quite important. His role, I think, has been quite understated over the years. Uh, um, but it's one of the most important things I think that the Energy Office does is to help um, all the energy stakeholders become better prepared, uh, for, especially for emergencies, natural disasters. Um, he's always leading the teams that collect inventory information and make sure that we don't run out of key resources, energy resources during these times. When they happen, everyone expects it to happen flawlessly. Mark's one of those people that gets that done. And I really value his opinions on what, ought, what needs to be invested in. So it'll be great to have him at the table talking about this along. And he works very closely with David Lopez uh, in terms of the future planning on these issues. Yeah, resiliency begs a significant investment. Everybody puts off investing in resilience because it's, oh, well, it's not here today. But like you say, when, when the storm hits or, or we, the, the grid grows down, then everybody wants it to work right away. And you have to invest in it ahead of time. You can't just, you know, hope it's going to be OK. Yeah, so, so uh, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, when, when those discussions are finished, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'll moderate that pan, the, the joint panel. And then we'll ask all the participants to participate in a moderated dialogue to identify the highest priorities. And then we'll ask the takeaway question on all of this will be, what can the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum do to support the next steps to identify and communicate to all the appropriate energy stakeholders um, how to address these priorities through the opportunities provided by the bipartisan infrastructure um, funding through the bi 
bipartisan infrastructure bill? Yeah, so that the state is really coordinated in how we're gonna invest this money and make sure it's used in the best possible way. Yeah, I mean, you know, unfortunately there is no coordinated function for this in the state of Hawaii and in most states. So we're kind of lucky that we have this vehicle and we'll take advantage of it. And at least the outreach that I've had so far is that, you know, all of the players that have uh, previously been uh, members of the forum or really appreciate this opportunity to, you know, have the form kind of reinstated and to make this its first priority focus. So the next slide is titled discussants, which is a new word for me. I haven't heard that one before, but uh, it looks like uh, we're gonna hear from our leadership uh, in the legislature and also uh, the, P, uh, the uh, PUC. So talk about uh, our leadership here, uh, Mark. Yeah, and you know, discussing it's it's, it's an academic term. I'm now at the university, so you know, I I, I, I I use stuff like that. But you know, it, it it's nothing more than they have kind of a in in a briefing like this, which you know has essentially it's like a conference, it's like a symposium in a in a way. They have the ability to basically draw from anything that had been discussed before and to provide their own comments and opinions about it. Um, clearly we're going to be dealing with, this is a briefing for the legislature, so we're going to have the chairs of the energy uh, environment um, committees um, in both the Senate and the House. Um, first, we're going to have uh, Senator Glenn Wakai, um, the Senate Chair Committee Energy, uh, Economic Development and Tourism, to weigh in on, on what he sees as the priorities. You know, we're hoping that he will uh, take this opportunity to talk about infrastructure needs, uh, but he will talk about, again, what he sees overall, and then hopefully we can apply infrastructure funds to help solve what, what it is that he identifies. Obviously, from an oversight standpoint, the Public Utilities Commission really is the you know, most important agency in ensuring that we move forward, particularly in, in the electricity sector. Um, and they're the ones that uh, essentially are the quarterback in the sense of providing guidance uh, in terms of solicitations for generation and obvi obviously in um, overseeing the investments that utilities make on infrastructure uh, for grid modernization and so on. So it's, it'll be quite important to hear from uh, Commissioner Potter what her sense of those priorities are. Uh, and so we, we wanted to uh, definitely have the view of the commission there. Okay, let's have the uh, fifth slide. So session two, uh, remaking transportation. This is one of my favorite subjects, of course. Uh, yep. Critical infrastructure, EVs, hydrogen, and other eco-friendly vehicles. So why don't you introduce uh, Pradip Pant? Yeah, Pradeep Pant uh, is the uh, planning program administrator statewide for the Department of Transportation. So, as I mentioned, you know, there's two key flowdowns: uh, the federal uh, transportation funds and the reauthorization of the Surface Transportation Act, which goes to the state transportation department. So, right. so clearly, the chief planner there is is essential. Okay in terms of guiding what the priorities are. So he's gonna be able to talk about that. He'll talk about um, some of the key programs that are underway that these funds could really fit into. Um, clean bus program. And uh, the way that uh, the State Department of Transportation now is looking at um, life cycle pricing to be able to actually better target investments in a smart way. So I'm very excited about having him on the program. Um, I think we're still waiting for confirmation from Riley Saito, but when we spoke to him earlier, he was uh, eagerly talking about uh, the efforts that he's leading uh, to look at hydrogen as a, you know, playing a key role in um, Hawaii Island's uh, transportation program. And Aki Marceau, uh, is, is doing a wonderful job 
in helping lead the electrification process for transportation at HECO and dealing with the very difficult job of trying to upgrade their uh, transmission and distribution infrastructure to be able to handle, you know, these 60 amp, uh, you know, chargers at, at homes. And of course, this whole fast charging network uh, that needs to be implemented quite rapidly to be able to handle this new demand of electric vehicles. Uh, so very eager to see, you know, what the HECO strategy is to deal with this. Exactly. And then once again, at the end, we'll have a dialogue on the priority gaps and needs. That's as right. For so and then moving we'll, on, uh, sorry, yeah. uh, we, we're, uh, we need to uh, move on a little bit because we're out of time, basically, but we're going to take more time. Um, discussants, once again, uh, the perspective of uh, Representative uh, Nicole Lowen, who's uh, in the House of Rep Representatives. Right. Um, well, Nicole has been uh, an extremely uh, important figure. Uh, she's done a great job over the last number of years in making some transformational um, measures uh, on energy uh, development in the state. Uh, is not unafraid to speak plainly about what need what's needed. So yeah. having you're in this key role to kind of wrap up. Uh, the discussion, I think, is is very timely. Yeah, she's a real champion of transportation. Like right. you said, she's not afraid to speak her mind. No, so, I had to be uh, on the situation. Yeah, right. So in this last slide, I decided I thought it'd be good to put in a link to our the Energy Policy Forum website. And uh, this uh, uh, briefing is open to everybody, the general public, and you can get to it by going to the website and uh, registering. Uh, and there's a link uh, on our site uh, where you can register for this event. And uh, we'll capture your name and your contacts and you can dial in, we can take hundreds of people. So we welcome everybody to participate in this uh, briefing and uh, you can make your uh, thoughts known by telling us what you think about it. We'd really love to have the feedback. It is open Mark, to everyone. Yeah, go ahead. It is open to everyone, uh, and uh, all you have to do is uh, go to the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum website to get the link for registration. Free registration, uh, you'll be in, and it's something I, I don't really think you want to miss. That's great. So we're going to have to leave it there, Mark, because we're totally out of time. And so you've been watching Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Think Tech Hawaii, and today we've been talking story with the chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Mark Glick, about the Hawaii Energy Poly Policy Forum's uh, 2022 legislative brief, which is only next week. We so thanks, for some, thanks a lot, Mark. And, and thanks to our viewers for tuning in. And I'm Mitch Ewan. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. Mm -hmm.